Welcome everyone to another Sunday. We are grateful and thankful that you could join us here today. Uh, we are excited that we have another service that we can share and spend time together like this. Today we will be continuing with the seven I am sayings of Christ where our brother Kwesi will be taking us through Jesus being the resurrection and the life. And also today is a special Sunday, especially for all the fathers. It is Father's Day. Uh, happy, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. We are really encouraged uh, and, and, and really appreciate the role that you continually play in society. And we just want to celebrate all, um, all the fathers who are with us in God's tribe and everyone who has joined us today. Uh, may God richly bless you. May God continually give you the strength and grace to do what it is you do within your households. That being said, I just want to hand over the service into the Lord's hands. Maybe all close our eyes and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity for us to meet like this on a Sunday. We thank you that, Lord, it is, uh, even as it is a special Sunday for all the fathers out there, we are thankful that you remain our Heavenly Father. We are thankful that you, Lord Jesus, continually uh, oversee and look after us, your, 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 your people. Father God, we also just pray specifically for the service today. May you empower everyone who will be in, on the worship team or, and, and preaching. We pray that your Holy Spirit may breathe life and speak and empower and, 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 and um, enable them, Lord Jesus, to be able to minister effectively. We look forward to the time we will have today. And we pray specifically for our fathers that you will continually grant them with grace and strength to be the role models and to be the pillars in their households. We thank you, Father, for this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. At this point, I'd like to hand over the service to Christine and the band. Over to you, Christine.
mustard seed can move the mountains, Lord Jesus. We pray for that kind of faith today, Jesus. That you would give us the faith to, to understand that you can, you can do what you say you're going to do, Jesus. You are the one you say you are, and you do the things you say you do, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Thank you so much, Christine and the band for that lovely time in worship. Right now, before we go over into our message, just a few announcements and a few reminders of the different aspects of our church life that we have. First one being on life groups, just a continual reminder that we continue to remain connected over this period of time. We thank you for all the people who have engaged so far in the various life groups across the city who are remaining connected using various means. We are encouraged by it and we continually encourage you that if you aren't connected to a life group, could you kindly reach out to the contact details uh, to find out a place where you can remain connected even through the week and so that we can remain in community uh, with our brother, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. For our next announcement, we'll be going into a time of offering. This is a time where we believe that we can worship God with the substance that he has indeed given to us. We're thankful that God continually shows his generosity through the scriptures and in our lives personally. And this is an opportunity for us to give back to the work uh, for the church, where the fundings will be used and dedicated to the work uh, of the church and the work of Christ in our city. There are details on your screen right now. If you could kindly use them, uh, there's the banking details which are available as well as mobile money. So those are the various channels in which we can continually remain connected uh, and support the work of the church during this period. And now we'd just like to hand over to Kwesi who will be taking us through uh, another installment in our 7 I Am sayings. Over to you Kwesi. Good morning Ghost Tribe. It's a joy to be with you again this morning. I uh, hope we're all doing well, our loved ones. And thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, I trust that this morning's message will bless you. Uh, as we get into this morning's word, uh, please prepare your hearts uh, and let the Lord really speak to us through his word. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our seven I am sayings of Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been in it for the last couple of weeks. Today, we look at the fifth I am saying, uh, which says Jesus as the resurrection and the life. It's very interesting because the resurrection, um, also known as uh, the anastasis, is the concept of coming back to life from death. Now, there are times when we wish uh, that people that we really love uh, are able to come back to life. You know, it's a genuine feeling. We would really wonder uh, if that is possible. Well, there's one that really comes to mind that I want to share with you. Uh, my wife and I lived in Brazil many years ago. Um, and one thing we learned about Brazilian people is that uh, they love their idols and their icons. Uh, and it's not only football players. Uh, one of them happens to be a Formula One driver called Ayrton Senna. Uh, so Ayrton was a compelling character as an individual. Uh, excellent race car driver. Actually reputed to probably be the most talented Formula One race car driver that has ever lived. Uh, he won three world championships at a very young age uh, and would have won many more. But tragically, on May 1st, 1994, he died in a race crash in his Formula One car. It was a very sad moment for the whole world, the fans of Formula One racing, but particularly for Brazilians, uh, who had seen him as a source of joy and hope and passion at a time when the country was going through a really tough time. I heard many say that they would have loved for him to be able to come back to life. In fact, they wished, they prayed uh, that it would be possible for Aitin to come back, but it wasn't possible. Well, Formula One actually went on to improve safety in that sport, uh, something that I think we should all know, uh, that since then, which is 26 years ago, not a single driver has died in a Formula One car since then. But let's come back to what it is that we're looking at, which is the concept of dying and coming back to life. We really want to understand who is it that can really do this. These days, there are many of such claims. You know, we see videos all over social media. We hear stories all around the world of people claiming either to have raised other people from life or to have come back to life themselves. Well, today we are not looking so much at somebody else being raised from the dead, but the power for an individual to be able to cause themselves to come back to life. Well, that's what points us uh, to Jesus. And in doing that, we realize that 
we really need Jesus to desperately be able to come back to life because so much depends on it. Uh, so rather than wish that other loved ones would, would be able to do this, uh, our focus is on Jesus. And hopefully as we go through today's discussion, we will see if indeed he did that uh, and what that really means uh, for our lives. We will be doing that looking at a passage in John chapter 11. Uh, wonderful scripture, uh, and which I hope some of you know. Uh, but our passage this morning is a bit long. We are looking at uh, from verse 1 to 44. Now, because it tells a very lovely story of the life of Lazarus and his sisters and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, we are going to go through the whole story. So stay with me uh, and try to keep up as we read this passage uh, that launches us into this interesting discussion about Jesus as the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, starting from verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and, his sis and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you. And yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, 
and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took, they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. This is the passage we're looking at this morning. Very strong and passionate message about what Jesus went through leading up to raising Lazarus from the dead. But we will have to consider this entire passage and ask ourselves, how does that help us establish Jesus' claim that he is the resurrection and the life? Well, we're going to look at it in three parts. The first one we will consider is the power of indestructible life. The power of indestructible life. You can think of it as, in other words, or another way of saying this is really the power over death. Jesus showed his power over death in the patience he exhibited through the process leading up uh, to Lazarus' raising from the dead. He seemed not to be in any rush. When he was told that the, the brother he loved was sick, he spent more time. He waited more days even before he set off on his journey. When he arrived just out of the city limits of Bethany, he stayed outside the village. Mary and Martha went out and had conversations with him, but he hadn't yet come into the village. All this so that in his own words, like he said, that a son of God might be glorified. Well, Jesus' claim of the resurrection of the life and being the resurrection and the life is not a hollow one. Because he has raised other people from the dead, Scripture tells us. So we know that Lazarus is not an isolated situation. But beyond that, I think the part that we want to focus on more this morning is the fact that Jesus himself laid down his life and he took it up again in that wonderful story of resurrection that we have come to be so familiar with. The Gospels give us a very clear account of this. So all four Gospels talk about this. The book of Acts goes on to talk about how this inspires faith and passion in the disciples to go ahead and build the church. And the rest of the New Testament is actually written on this pillar of the knowledge that Jesus is alive. Now, how are we so convinced that he is alive? Let me point you to something that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or 15. So Paul wrote in verse 3 to verse 8, saying this, For what I received I pass on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. 
And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Well, we see that there are many witnesses, not just of Jesus' death, because it was a public event, the crucifixion on the cross. But now we see there are countless witnesses to Jesus being alive post his resurrection. So, if I were to ask you how convinced you are that Jesus actually died, was buried, and raised himself from the dead. Well, how convinced will you be in that truth? It is such an important truth that I would encourage you to get more into it. We don't have the time this morning um, to get into all of it. So let me recommend some homework. I would suggest go and check the gospel accounts of the resurrection story. Read it for yourself. Observe what he says. Try to pick out what the message is. I would encourage you to actually discuss it with someone. Friends from the church, your life group. But beyond that, there is a lot that is written on this subject because of how important it is uh, in the Christian faith. So, if you are up to it, I would recommend you to even go further in your study. There are books on this. And one that I particularly commend to you this morning is a book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. So Lee was an investigative journalist. He had an atheist for that. His wife was a, uh, a lady who became Christian. And it upset him terribly. So in order to try to convince her that she was wrong, he set off on a mission to disprove the claims of the Bible. Well, I'll leave you to find out the rest. Check out that book. Uh, and it happens that that book has actually been produced into a movie. So you will be able to see that production as well. But it's important that we understand the truth and the evidence that scripture presents us around Jesus' resurrection. But I have seen it because it's clearly presented in scripture. And I can tell you that I'm convinced because it is said so powerfully and Jesus continues to act on it, including in our lives today. So Jesus' resurrection from the dead indicates his eternal priesthood. The fact that he's defeated, conquered death, tells us that this priesthood is eternal. It doesn't come to an end. That's why we can be confident that he's there in the heavens, representing us on our behalf. And we can continue to lift our voices up to him. Jesus asked Martha a question. He said, do you believe this? When he mentioned this claim. Well, that is a central question for us too. So as you go through the study that I have recommended, as you read these accounts, you check out the book, you see the movie, ask yourself, well, do I truly believe this in my heart. And let's hope that as that truth becomes apparent, you would then be able to respond to it. Because that's what the Lord is calling us to. That if you believe, then give your life to it. And if that's the case, then we commit our lives to the Lord and allow Him to be our Lord and personal Savior. At that point where we can call ourselves true children of God. Well, when that happens, then there needs to be some changes that we see. And that takes us to our second point this morning. That second point is Christ's resurrection guarantees our regeneration. Christ's resurrection guarantees our regeneration. But it is through Jesus' resurrection that our salvation is assured. Now, we see that the symbolism shows in baptism we talk about the fact that we are buried with christ you know in immersion in water and we are resurrected with him as well the linkage between his resurrection and the new life that we have in regenerative life as children of god well, jesus says comfortingly to mary and martha that this sickness will not end in death well, no, it is for the glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. 
we can hear him telling us the very same thing now. That the sickness of fleshly desires, the sickness of sin, the sickness of continuing to follow the wrong ways, well, that is not going to last. It is not going to end in spiritual death because the Lord has stepped in and made it possible for us to have an opportunity of eternal life. That is what the resurrection brings to bear in our lives. Let's see what scripture even points even more clearly around this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says this, We have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we have been born anew. That's what Jesus' resurrection does in our lives. The question is, do we see that transformation happen as we've gotten through this regenerative experience? This passage that we looked at earlier at, in 1 Corinthians 15 says a bit more to us. And it indicates why it is so important for this transformatory case to be established in our lives. And why Jesus' resurrection is such a central part of our faith. Because without it, we have no hope to hold on to. Without it, we cannot have this life anew. In verses 17 and 19 of 1 Corinthians, 19, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the scripture says this, And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. It is only, if it is only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of all people to be most pitied. We are being reminded of the centrality of Jesus' resurrection to our own Christian lives. That if indeed it was not the case, then that new life that we have, or we are supposed to have in Him, would not exist. And in the same vein, the eternal life that we look forward to with the Lord, well, would not exist either. Because if He is not alive and not able to guarantee us that new life, then indeed there is nothing to look forward to. That's the reason the resurrection is so central. And the reason we should be unequivocal, unequivocal about our convinced state and stance and belief of what happened to Jesus through his death and his resurrection. The I am sayings of Jesus that we are looking at today about him saying he is the resurrection and the life is actually a claim to deity because he is saying that without him salvation doesn't happen without him well what we know to expect at the end of time will not happen the second coming would basically be non-existent that is a claim to deity. And that is us saying effectively that indeed we recognize you are Lord. Now it reminds me of how we say it right here um, in Swahili. Jinalaku litukuzwe. That let your name be exalted, be glorified. Because you're the only one that deserves it. Why is that? Because there's no one else that can make this arrangement for us. There is no one else that can give us this package that causes certainty, not just in our life today, for the hope we have, but also for what lies ahead. That is what Jesus has done for us. And the question then is, where does it lead us? That takes us to our next point. Our third point is Christ's resurrection guarantees that we will receive perfect resurrection bodies. Christ's resurrection guarantees that we will receive perfect resurrection bodies. This is reminding us of what comes at the end of time. The eschatology story. The one that sometimes we're all not so sure about. 
Well, if we look at the evidence of what we've been talked about this morning, there is one thing we know for sure by now. Jesus is alive, which means his promise of returning is sure. So he is coming back again. The New Testament shows us in a number of places the connection between Jesus' resurrection and rising on the last day, which is the rest of us, because he says when he comes, there will be bodily resurrection of his people. Paul presents an extensive discussion on this in the passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that we looked at. Uh, now, look at it yourself, because it's in, it starts from verse 12 all the way to the end of that passage in verse 58. But when he's concluding, he starts from verse 20 to make a very strong point. In verse 20, he says that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, in calling Christ the first fruits, he is using an agricultural example to tell us that the same way that the ripening of the crop, we get the first fruits from that, which points to the fact that the rest of the harvest is going to follow that same pattern, that same quality of fruit. Well, that's exactly what Paul is reminding us of in this point about Christ being the first fruit. If he is indeed the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, well then he set an example and he set the path for the bodily resurrection of his people when he returns, just as he has promised. This is important because it completes the work that Christ has done. He started, he gave us hope, he gave us transformation in salvation. He's giving us sanctification and the ability to live in Him now and through the future until He returns. But if we were not returning, if we were not being raised in incorruptible bodies, if we were not being transformed at the end and spending eternal life with Him after He had judged the world, well then, the work is incomplete. That is why this is the worthy completion of his work. And that's why he says he is the resurrection and the life. Because they connect together to eternal life. Where indeed we reach the destination of enjoying endless time with our Lord and Savior. Martha was clearly a very good student of the scriptures. In her interaction with Christ, there are a few things that we see. In verse 24, she made the statement that her brother to rise again on the last day, indicating that she had an understanding for the events of the end of the world. Jesus had basically just told her that indeed he had all power. But her admission showed that she knew what that truth really meant. Not only did she believe, she said, well, you can ask God now and he will give you anything. But I also know that yes, 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 my brother can resurrect, but on the last day. Well, the question is, do we have that same understanding of God's word? If we encountered Christ in that conversation, would we be able to point to the fact that, well, Lord, your scripture actually does say that you would do this for us on the last day. I think that's another encouragement uh, that we see in the life of Martha and Mary in terms of how their hearts truly held on to the truth of scripture. True belief and faith in what the Lord could do. And the Lord went and acted uh, just as he had said he would in bringing Lazarus back to life. Well, all these things are important in showing us the scriptural basis of his claim. And why it's important, because it takes us from the beginning of our Christian lives all the way to where we expect to end in eternal life. But what changes should that cause in our lives? The significance only shows true if we can see that the, the lifestyle that the Lord has given us is showing a life that points to that hope. Well, that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, again, 
at the very end, in verse 58, it says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the labor, the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, we are being reminded that, yes, we've been called to this walk with the Lord. But as we walk this, the Lord continues to be in control. His hand is upon everything that we do. That He's steadfast through this in keeping us. That indeed, the work that we are doing in this life has eternal significance. So ask ourselves, how are we contributing to God's work? How are we contributing to the harvest? He says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Are we putting our hand to the plow? Whether it is speaking the word to someone, whether it is serving in the church, whether it is letting your life truly speak to the authenticity. Now we'll look at the significance of this work that the Lord has done in actually starting, helping us through our Christian lives, through sanctification and living through the Spirit, and obviously what we have to look forward to um, in eternal life. One of the first things that uh, we want to consider is our own labor in the Lord. The passage we looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, has an encouragement for, for us. Uh, let's look at verse 58, the very last verse of that passage. And it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, Christ was raised from the dead, so we too shall be raised on the last day, like we mentioned. Well, that means that we need to be steadfast in His work. We need to represent Him as He's giving us that opportunity to do in this land. Well, how are we doing that? How are you putting your hand to the plow and contributing to God's kingdom? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we need to work harder and ask ourselves that the Lord uses us as vessels of honor to continue to advance His work. So whether it is speaking the word to someone, whether it is serving in the church, or whether it is how we live our own lives so that it can testify to the truth of God's word. We are all called to make sure that our labor is a faithful labor. Because if it is, the word is telling us that it will not be in vain. And we do this really until the Lord returns. Because that's what he's giving us. uh, In order for us to say uh, his coming is one that we can joyously and excitedly look forward to. Well, secondly, we can say that we are encouraged because we have a hope and a goal to look forward to. To see the resurrection and all the struggles in this life being repaid is a true thing to look forward to. You know, times are tough. Life may be hard. We may be going through difficulty, suffering. But if you look at the eternal hope, we can endure through the times. And we can look at Christ and the example he set in order for us to make it through. It's an important perspective. Because if we have an earthly perspective, there are certain things the Lord calls us to that we are not able to do. Think of generosity in giving to God's work. If we think solely of our own needs in this land, we hold back. But God says that we understand that we are stewards in Him, for Him. So we give generously over and above even what our own hearts may be able to comprehend. Why? Because we are doing so in worship to Him. We are giving ourselves to Him and expressing our dependence in looking forward to that eternal hope. Not abandoning our responsibilities in this land, 
but learning to live with an eternal perspective, not an earthly perspective. Well, finally, I would say that the resurrection also really helps us to have a perspective of not continuing to yield to sin. Because indeed, it causes a transformation in our lives. It causes us to be born anew. And when that happens, well, lots of scriptures, including those in Romans, tells us that we are dead to sin. We are alive to God in Christ Jesus. And if that is indeed the case, then we need to see that transformation in leaving the things of the world behind. Living a life that shows true faithfulness. Living a life that shows purity. Living a life that shows the beauty of Christ. That is something that continues to be a struggle in the church today. Because, like we say, the church has become quite worldly to the point where it's almost difficult in some places to separate the two. But is that what we are called to? Well, definitely not. Because we are called to a radical transformation of life to show that indeed we are now faithful, proclaiming, living children of God. Well, that's my encouragement to you this morning, my brothers and sisters. And I trust that as the Lord has given us this message, that we will dwell on it. We will hinge on it and let it encourage our hearts in the way we live our lives. Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. Let it show in your life as well. Let's pray. Our dear Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that our hearts can rest in the truth of your resurrection, but that we may also be able to live a life that testifies to that truth. We thank you that we've been able to proclaim this to you, that we can bring our desires, our supplications before you, and that you've heard us. And when you've heard, we know that you are able to do according to your will. We trust that you will do that in our lives, even today and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you, Kwesi, for that lovely message and then a reminder and an encouragement to us to live a life that reflects the resurrection life that we so clearly see in Christ Jesus. Just a few reminders before we go and part ways. The first one being on life groups. Kindly remain connected or reach out to, to the number on your screen if you are looking to be placed in a life group. And if you are currently in a life group, we encourage you to continually meet via virtual means over the week and continually remain in community with our fellow brothers and sisters. Another reminder as well is that we have different prayers that we have as a church. We have men's prayers and women's prayers, but also we have uh, corporate prayers before service on a Sunday, which happens bi-weekly. And currently, even after the service, if you have any prayer requests, you could kindly reach out, uh, leave a comment, or reach out to our WhatsApp number, where we'll have the prayer ministry team currently receiving prayer requests and praying over the same after the service. On that note, we'd just like to wish you a wonderful week and we hope to see you again, same time, same place next week. God bless you.